I welcome you to this session. The first talk uh, is by Carmen Tavalica, and I'm also co-author here by chance, Grass GIS in the Cloud Actinia Geoprocessing. And uh, Carmen is developer in the company Mondialis in Bonn, and uh, involved, heavily involved in the development of this software here. She wants to uh, demonstrate you today. Thank you, Markus. Welcome everyone to my talk, Kraskis on the Cloud, Actinia Geoprocessing. As Markus already said, I'm working for Mundialis. It's located in Bonn, Germany, and we focus on processing geodata. And I worked there since 2015. That's the year when the company was founded. So I'm there from the nearly beginning. And uh, this involved doing a lot of different things, doing web page design and uh, web client building, data processing. So I already have a lot of experience in broad topic. Um, yeah, but then we developed an idea. There was a new paradigm um, occurring with Copernicus Sentinel data to bring algorithm to the data. Also, it might be nice in this context to exploit CRASTGIS functionality um, via HTTP REST API to use it um, in the internet. And then the name occurred CRAS, CRASTGIS as a service. That was the initial name of Actinia. And this all led to the thinking of how can we put CRASTGIS into the cloud. <coughs> to understand this, we need to have a little bit know-how about Kraskis. Who of you heard about Kraskis? Okay, I expected this. <laughs> and who has worked with Kraskis? Okay. And I see people developing. Who is developing Kraskis? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, so there, are, there's one concept we need to understand. One thing is how the geodata is integrated in Kraskis and handled. We have the KrasDB, which is basically a folder. And inside there, we have different locations um, co yeah, connected to different EPSG codes. And inside these locations, we have different map sets. And this would be a proje project where we're working on. And one map set can have all different types of data like raster data, vector data, spatial temporal data, and all other geodata we can imagine. Another thing to understand is that Kraskis is built up using uh, so-called Kras modules, and there are, I don't know, 300, you can correct me about this, 400. Um, yeah, and they are all organized to be used with different data. If they start with a V, they're used for vector data. If they start with an R, they're used for raster data. And many different um, tiny ones, like VClip, just clips geometries, but they are also much more complex ones building whole processing chains. Okay, how can we bring this into the cloud? We can build a REST API on top of CRASGIS and exploit the locations, map sets as resources. We need to enable the usage of the CRAS modules, all of, all of them. And um, because we um, are working in the web, it's good to be somehow managed with user management, so you can sign in and not everyone can access like large processing because it costs money to set it up. Um, also, it's important to think on more large scale. I knew that CrustGIS was set up in cluster before. And in the cloud, we have the same problem. When multiple users want to access the same data, that there might be concurrency. So we need to implement a locking system. And we need to think about um, the CrustDB management itself. So how does this management work? We have a shared um, file system where all the data is mounted. And it's, what is better, this or this? The last one? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, 
We have the read-only file system where all the data is located, but to calculate fastly, we mount it in all the Actinia nodes. Actinia nodes is like an installation of what we saw before, the GRASGIS, and on top, the Actinia REST API. And there are more of them. I explain this a little bit later. And the data which we are used for processing is then mounted into the nodes, so we can fastly do calculations in the separate nodes. There are different um, calculation modes. If we calculate persistent, the data is written back to a user database. If we look at this more abstract, we have the CREST database and we have different Actinia nodes, but somehow these nodes need to communicate. This is done with a Redis database, and if um, a process is started, the it is written into the Redis database. So the processing node can know the status and update the status, but if somebody requests the status, every node is enabled to look it up in the Redis database. So this is all connected. And to put this into the cloud, we have a um, lot of work done by cool people to help us with this. We don't need to start from scratch. So we use Docker and Actinia is installed in Docker, and we have different setups already. So it works with Docker Swarm. Everyone who knows Docker Compose, it's really easy just to change the config a little bit and say, I want to run eight nodes of this. And we also have um, it in, in Red Hat, with it's then called Pods. It's all similar, a little bit different, but it all leads to the usage of having CRASTJS in the cloud with different nodes, and the user doesn't need to care which node he is talking to. He just requests the system, and then there's a load balancer, depending on which um, software we use, like Docker Compose, uh, Docker Swarm, and then it's processing in any of these nodes. Okay, but what is the actual communication that takes place? As I said, it's a REST API, and we can request locations. And if requested, this is an example response to list available locations in Actinia. Or if you want to get more detailed information, what map sets are in this location, you can also request this. Um, and then it's, it's like going down, who knows, the REST API knows that the resources are like hierarchically ordered, and then in the map set permanent, I want to see all raster layers, and then I get a list. And I, there are also some functionalities like render functions, so I can see the maps which are already in the CRUST database. So then there's a concept of how to work with all the CRUST modules to not only list locations, we want to do processing. So there are two processing types, ephemeral and persistent. I already said about persistent that calculations can be conducted, and when the results are calculated, they are written back to the CRAS database we saw before. There's also the possibility to calculate ephemeral. This means that all my results are calculated and then written somewhere where I can download them as a GeoTIFF, for example, or as a shapefile. And on the right, you see an example process chain that is one generic endpoint of Actinia, where all the CRAS modules can be chained, and CRAS can be used in a JSON format and just sent to Actinia to conduct all the processes that we want to conduct. And there's an example in outputs. If I run it ephemeral, I, I can export it as a GeoTIFF. So the, here's an example. I call this um, generic endpoint with my process chain. It is, uh, it's this one, it's airslope aspect on a one certain map. Then Actinia responds with a JSON. It tells you the status about the processing. And one possibility is that I pull the status and just ask, how are you, are you still running, or what is the status? And when Actinia is finished, the JSON looks different and I can see the results. Another possibility is to tell an end, a, a webhook endpoint and then Actinia just notifies when the processing is finished. 
Okay, so now I want to see the results. And then I can request the URLs that Actinia sent me from the processing. There's not only the um, process chain option where all the CAS modules can be changed, there's also some predefined endpoints which we can use. Um, this relates to the um, idea that I said before to bring the algorithm to the data because um, it Actinia also enables the use of um, Sentinel data and not to download it to the own laptop or to download it all the time, but there are different plugins implemented. And um, examples are to access Amazon AWS or Google Cloud Storage, and they have the advantage that not the whole scene is downloaded, but I can choose between different <coughs> themes, or even use of um, a Dias platform where I can, when Actinia is installed there, I can mount the data directly and don't need to download it. And this plugin can also be used in the process chain when I run a importer, kind of Actinia module, or I can use predefined process chains. One example of a predefined process chain is Sentinel-2 process. You see there NDVI and then a scene ID. And then we play the same play again. Uh, Responds with a JSON, pull the status. When it's done, the resources are listed. I get the URLs and then I get the result. This is a preview and yeah, I didn't upload the large result, if, but it would look like this. Okay, are there any other features? Yes. There are a lot of them. I won't go into detail into all of them. But one nice thing is called RCE, Actinia Command Execution. And the people who work with CRAS heavily might feel more comfortable using this because they can just work on the command line, enter a CRAS command, and then run um, or config, configure the Actinia instance they want to calculate with. And they, then they don't execute the commands on the local machine, but on the Actinia Cloud instance. <coughs> and another cool thing is OpenEO. It's an H2020 project, and unfortunately, at this exact time, there's a talk about it, so you can't see it, but maybe look it in the videos after. And it's um, a project to develop an API where multiple processing engines are somehow defining a language where the user can conduct processing and doesn't need to know which backend to use, but just can easily conduct processing. And with OpenAO, we developed the OpenAO Kraskis driver, and because Actinia was already there with a REST API, we set this on top so it can be used on the project. Okay, what we want to do, like every open source project, there are always a lot of things to do. Um, the first two ones are a little bit technical. It's some kind of process chain management, also via REST, so that, that I can create my own process chain and then store it and then execute it all the time and I don't need to save it locally. Um, yeah, I wo won't go into details for all of them, but other things are like um, refactoring <laughs> because the project grew over the time and it wasn't clear at the beginning what <laughs> would be uh, integrated everywhere, so refactoring is always a good thing to make the code more clear. <coughs> yeah, so great news. Actinia became an OSU community project this year, and um, you can find us on GitHub at uh, Mundialis Actinia Core, and there are already some plugins, like the satellite plugin I told before, or a statistic plugin. Um, yeah, and also the API docs are great to get an overview of what, what Actinia can do and what all the endpoints that can be listed. <laughs> Yeah, so that was an overview about Actinia. Do you have any questions?
Yeah, I just want to know um, because you mentioned there's different options on which kind of which software you you use to to put into the cloud and all that. If I want to install that my own instance, what do I need? I mean, everything is already integrated in the GitHub um, repo you just saw, and the easiest way is to start with Docker, and you can find the Docker files for Actinia inside and can try a local setup. And then with Docker Compose, there's already Redis integ integrated. And when you feel ready, you can just switch it to a Docker Swarm configuration. It's already in this repository as well. And then it's like some command line uh, executions, and then it's already up and running. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Now I understand what that Actinia is, but what I have in my mind is the following. We have OpenEO coming, and it seems to be coming quite nicely. Sometime this year, we'll have something similar, which is the um, Open Geo API coming from the OGC that will replace WFS, WCS, WMS, blah, blah, blah. And we'll also have Actinia. So I see you know, these REST APIs popping up like mushrooms. And I would like to understand, from your perspective, uh, within your company, Mondialis, how is this all playing together? I think it all evolves at the same time and can uh, participate from each other. As I said, we are all um, as well involved in OpenEO. And it's not, there are many new things, but they can all um, learn from each other, I think. I think it's good to no, not have only one thing, and that's the thing, but to have multiple things, and they get better. That's my opinion. Okay, more questions? Um, maybe I missed it at the beginning, but my question is, is it uh, targeted only to grass, or is it open for other processing? Uh, <laughs> tools or, or, or applications which could integrate it in these processing chains? It's open. Um, it's designed for CRAS modules, but not only. It's already possible to execute um, Python code, which can be uploaded, and um, also some command lines like GDA processing or PROI processing are already supported. And um, yeah, it's possible to conduct any code. More questions? So just to uh, make you understand how this is uh, possible, um, you know that grass add-ons exist, and grass add-ons, they use the grass parser, so you have some dedicated lines in the beginning, and this you can even wrap around whatever other, let's say, command line tool you can imagine. Uh, you just stuff it into it and then uh, you could even execute a system call, but you have this grass parser around which is then delivering all the JSON stuff needed here. So it is pretty easy to do that. It's maybe 10 lines or so. And then you wrap around your own code. Um, most command line executions are prohibited because it's a security risk, but some can be done already directly. <coughs> 